Hello, all of my history-loving friends. Welcome to the world of Madame Morbid. Today, we are going to talk about a subject very dear to my heart. It is the wreck of the Titanic, which is what got me so interested in history and shipwrecks just in general. I've studied it off and on for my entire life. The reason my channel is called Madame Morbid is because I had a teacher humiliate me a while ago, I was in a class, it was that first day, introduce yourself, say something interesting, and the teacher just thought it was appalling that I was interested in Titanic. She said it was a tragedy, how could I be interested in something like that? A little bit of a kind of a how dare you. And so I have embraced that label. If liking history makes me morbid, then I absolutely am morbid. So much of history is tragedy. It's wars and plagues and crime and you know those are interesting topics and i'm sorry if someone writes a book about the battle of the bulge and are interested in the battle of the bulge that doesn't make them morbid so i'm wearing it as a badge of honor though and if you are morbid with me feel free please to subscribe to my channel but today you are going to see exactly why i think the titanic is such a fascinating topic we're going to be talking about a survivor today, a specific story of one person and how they survived. Halfway through this story, you are going to say, this person survived? And the answer is, yes, they did, amazingly. We're going to be talking about the highest ranking officer to survive the sinking. His name is Charles Herbert Lightoller. He had been on ships in some capacity since 1888 at the age of 13. Before Titanic, he had been shipwrecked on a desert island. He had fought a fire on board a ship. He had been in a cyclone and survived it. Pretty much everything I'm going to tell you today comes directly from his autobiography, Titanic and Other Ships, which is full text available online. He also decided to become a gold prospector, which he did not succeed at. He became a cowboy in Canada for a while. He gave that up and decided to come back across Canada. He did that as a hobo, getting on trains. By the time he got back to England, he was completely penniless. And he started going back to ships. This is by 1900. He's only 21 and he's done all of this stuff. So at this point, he joins White Star Line. And he serves mostly on the Majestic, the Oceanic, the Medic. And right before Titanic, he is on... Oceanic. He's first officer of Oceanic. He served a lot with Captain Smith prior to Titanic. He knew him very, very well. Smith had been in charge of Titanic's sister ship before Titanic, the Olympic. So he was really familiar with a very similar vessel. It was his final voyage. He was going to retire after this. As first officer of the Oceanic, Lightoller was under the impression he was going to be first officer of Titanic. But there was some last minute switching around. Originally, it was Captain Smith, Murdoch as chief officer, Lightoller, and it ended up getting switched. They added Henry Wilde from Olympic because he was very familiar with the ship and they thought that would be good for the first voyage. That moved everybody down a step. Then it was Captain Smith, Henry Wilde, Murdoch, and then Lightoller. He was with Titanic through her sea trials. He got on board a couple of weeks before the voyage. He said it took him two weeks to figure out how to get around on Titanic. It was just a labyrinth of these massive long hallways that turned and twisted. Lightoller had had watch, which ended at 10 o'clock that Sunday night, April 14th. First Officer Murdoch was to take over for him. He said it changed as normal. They always chatted for a few minutes until the eyes adjusted of those who were coming on duty. He said they chatted, they'd been on voyages together many, many times for many years. And he said they chatted about adventures past and present. They did the regular discussions of speed, position, weather, ice warnings. He said they discussed that an iceberg might be difficult to spot that night because it was crisply cold, not a cloud in the sky, calm seas. They weren't going to see waves breaking at the base. And there were a lot of icebergs that season because of an unusually warm spring, which had caused a lot of melting, which meant more icebergs. And when icebergs split off from another iceberg, they may flip over and be completely see-through. 
until there's been sufficient time that they frost over and you can see them white. Otherwise, they look completely invisible. Now, there were warnings they did not receive. Because of the way the Marconi system worked, Jack Phillips, at this time, working on a backlog of personal messages, when some ice warnings came in, he set them aside, put a paperweight on them, and just went on about his business, trying to get done what his employer expected. Safety and these safety warnings weren't really his priority. After the change in watch, Light Haller has to do a walkabout ship and just check everything out. He said that took at least an hour because he had to walk all of these endless passageways. It was a good one to two mile walk that he was taking. He described the temperature that night as the below zero of Canada. Although it probably wasn't quite that cold as far as the thermometer would say, it was a dang cold night and everybody's survival accounts I have read have discussed how absolutely bone chilling cold it was that night. He was really happy to finally get to his cabin. He changed into his pajamas and he curled up in bed and he said just as he was about to fall asleep when he hears the collision, quote, felt a sudden vibrating jar run through the ship. And he said it was less the collision itself because it certainly wasn't violent in any way, but it was the fact that he was so used to Titanic running so smooth and with very little vibration that it was more the interruption of that smoothness that drew his attention. He jumped out of bed instantly, went out of his cabin and ran to the port side of the ship to see if he could see what they'd hit. He didn't see anything. It had actually hit on the starboard side. By the time he ran to the starboard side, he also did not see it. It had already passed and was gone. The iceberg was tall enough that it did leave chunks of ice in the well deck forward of the bridge. He said his instinct was to run to the bridge and see what they had hit, but he resisted the urge to do that because if he did and somebody came to the room looking for him and he was not where they expected him to be, then it would just become a big hassle. He said about 10 minutes after the collision, he said the collision was around midnight. He's about 20 minutes off. It was 11.40. Around 11.50, Joseph Boxhall, the fourth officer, comes to his cabin, sees that he's there. Boxhall says, quote, we've hit an iceberg. Lightoller replied, quote, I know you've hit something. And then Boxhall replied to him, the water is up to F deck. On Titanic, the decks were numbered from the boat deck down alphabetically, A, B, C, D, E, F, for the water within 10 minutes to be up to F deck and in the mail room. I don't know if he was told it was in the mail room, but it was, it was bad. He knew it was bad, but he did not think Titanic would be completely lost. He put on a heavy sweater as well as pants over his pajamas and got to work. From reading his account, it does not seem anyone ever told him specifics of what damage had been done other than what he had just been told by Boxhall. He knew that the way Titanic was designed, two compartments could be completely flooded and the ship continue to float. They could have stabilized it. They would have had time to unload everybody, get them safely. He also could see the Californian less than two miles away and firmly believed that all they had to do was that ship pull beside them and they could transfer everybody and save everybody. Unfortunately, that vessel saw their rockets. It saw them trying to message with their Morse lamp and they never responded. The captain was notified of the rockets and he kept just saying, well, keep trying to contact them. They didn't turn the radio back on. And eventually everything disappeared. And they thought, oh, well, they sailed away. No, they sank. They're gone. He was very bitter when writing about this captain and the failure of the Californian to come to the aid of Titanic. Rockets only mean one thing it's at sea. And it means SOS. We need help. We're sinking emergency. 
This is going to factor into some of the decisions he makes, especially in the early boats he's loading. Lightoller was in charge of lowering boats on the port side or the left side of the ship. His first order was to uncover all of the boats and begin coiling down. She'd been going a pretty good clip. So once they stopped, there was a lot of steam that had to be vented off. All eight vents were going at the same time, and he said the noise was absolutely deafening. Nobody could speak with each other. You had to make hand gestures, and that was about the best you could do. And he said as passengers began appearing on deck, having no idea what's going on, being scared anyway, and then to have this cacophonous noise all around them must have been truly frightening. And he said all you could do was look at them, smile reassuringly, and hope that that noise would stop soon. By the time the boats had been uncovered and he ordered them swung out, he said the ship was noticeably listing. He knew they were taking on water at a pretty good rate. It's very interesting to me that in this book, that he wrote in 1935, Lightoller basically describes the damage to the ship exactly how they describe it now. When I was a child, they used to say Titanic was sunk by a 400 foot gash. And then through a bunch of testing, they eventually decided that no, it was more of a it bumping along and popping rivets. Well, that's essentially what Lightoller describes here. He says there must have been a shelf underwater that just bump, bump, bumped along Titanic's side, stoving in certain plates and letting in water all the way to six compartments, which mathematically made the ship absolutely doomed. He was very well aware of this, so I don't know why it took so long to disprove the 400-foot gash, which if it had had that, it would have sank within minutes, and it certainly wouldn't have sank slowly and levelly. That's just my observations. Here's how he said it exactly, quote, she just bump, bump, bumped along the berg, holding herself each time till she was making water in no less than six compartments. But he didn't know that at the time. Captain Smith knew it though. Thomas Andrews, the designer of Titanic, who was on board, had looked at the damage, he described it to Smith, and that should have been communicated to each and every officer, in my opinion. But according to Lightoller, no nobody ever told him that. The boats are swung out, ready to load. By this point, he said the water reached the main deck in the bow section. He still thinks once that second compartment fills up, that it will balance out and it will stop. Lightoller then says he sees Captain Smith, he approaches him. This roar is still going on all around everybody. He cups his hand and he goes up to the captain's ear and he says, hadn't we get the women and children in the boats, sir? The captain hears him, nods assent that yes, they should do that. He says he was prompted to do this because he saw the light of that other ship and he thought if he could get some of the women and children in the boats that they could get them over to that vessel. Lightoller's idea was to load the boats halfway at the deck level lower them to the water, then finish filling them from open gangway doors from deeper down in the ship. This also would have loaded people from the third class who had trouble getting to the boat deck. He sent the bosun's mate and six sailors down to open these doors. Unfortunately, these men completely disappeared and probably died trying to fulfill his orders. Then his plan was to get these people to this other vessel, unload them, and then presumably have them come back and get more people. Unfortunately, none of that worked out. His boats were being loaded halfway. He also had interpreted the rule, women and children first, as women and children only. And he absolutely stuck to this. If there were no more women and children, then that boat went away with empty seats. On the other side of the ship, Murdoch was not doing that. If you were standing there and he had an open seat, he puts you in it, no matter who you were. Pretty much every single man, except those pulled directly from the water, owe their lives to Murdoch. About the time that first boat was level with the deck, the horrible noise stopped. He said the way he helped women into the boat 
Lightoller said he had one foot on Titanic. The other foot he put inside the lifeboat. He would use his right hand to take the wrist of each lady. And then with his left, he would hook underneath her arm and basically lift her across the gap to get her into the lifeboat. The first boat he lowered was lifeboat four, which he filled with about 40 people. He gave it the order to head toward that door to then fill to capacity. The next lifeboat he lowered was lifeboat six. This lifeboat held Margaret Brown. You may know her as Molly Brown, which was a name she was given for the 1960s musical. Around the time he loaded lifeboat six, he reported hearing the band playing jazz music. He said he wasn't a big fan of jazz, but he was so happy to hear that at that time because it would help keep people from being so frightened. Passengers kept coming up to him and asking him if it was serious, and he said he always said no. Please don't worry. This is just a precaution. We want to make sure everybody's safe. Then they also started firing rockets, and of course everybody knows that rockets at sea mean a serious problem. The way he explained this when people would point that out to him is that they were trying to reach that ship over in the distance nearby trying to get their attention which was true that is what they were trying to do but they also were in grave peril yet he did not want to frighten anybody unnecessarily not telling people though how serious it was led them to choose to stay on board though rather than get into a lifeboat which is very unfortunate and then because he was following the rule of women and children only a lot of women refused to get in the boat if they couldn't take their husband with them when he filled lifeboat six he was lacking sailors to man these lifeboats he had sent seven of them away what happened was he needed a sailor to operate the, the falls as they were lowering the boat there wasn't anybody so samuel hemming who was in lifeboat six got out and took over that duty. And then people complained that there weren't any seamen in the boat, so he asked for a volunteer. Lightoller turned and asked if anybody there was an experienced seaman. Nobody said yes, except for one gentleman. His name was Arthur Puchin. He was from Canada. He said, I am not a sailor, sir, but I am a yachtsman, and I would be happy to help in any way I can. Lightoller told him that if he was sailor enough to climb out on that davit and slide down the ropes to the boat that was already halfway lowered, then he was very welcome to go along. This is the only man he put into a boat that night. And in his book, he very much defends Putin because any man who was in a lifeboat faced a lot of ridicule later in their life for having survived when so many women didn't. In the 1980s or 90s, Arthur Putin's wallet, which fell out of his pocket as he was climbing down into lifeboat six, was found on the bottom of the ocean. Between the lowering of each lifeboat, Lightoller would take a trip over to an emergency staircase in the forward part of the ship to see how far the water was rising. This emergency staircase, which was mostly a shortcut for crew, went from the boat deck down to sea deck. He used the staircase to try to gauge for himself how much time they had left. And as it creeped ever higher, he knew they were running out of time. He described seeing that water coming up with the lights burning within like this. Quote, that cold green water crawling its ghostly way up that staircase was a sight that stamped itself indelibly on my memory. Step by step, it made its way up, covering the electric lights one after the other, which, for a time, shone under the surface with a horribly weird effect. Unquote. The engineers deep within the ship were working very hard to keep the lights on. And he said, yes, they were running, but they were quite dim. They certainly didn't have the power that they would have on full power. If you've seen the 1997 movie, they have everything very well lit. It would not have been that bright. He did say it was bright enough that they could see each other and they could see what they were doing. Given this dimness of the light, he he was so irritated by one particular woman. He mentions her in his book. He said the lights were very dim, and but they helped us a great deal, except for one horrible woman who had this cane with a light in the head that she kept having glow in our faces and blinding us. He said that she complained once she was on Carpathia that someone had taken it from her. And he said it was because he had ordered it be confiscated from her and thrown into the sea because it was driving him so crazy. I'd never heard this story before. And so I looked up woman with lighted cane on Titanic. Her name was Ella White and she sounds like an absolute blast. And I plan to do an episode on her just by herself. Her cane 
has gone on auction recently. It was unbelievable for the time, that kind of technology. Now we would buy something like that, no, no problem. Anybody could afford that. But in that day and time, that was just the height of technology. She was a first class passenger. She was on board with basically her wife, a woman she lived with for decades. She was in lifeboat eight. So she definitely was in a lifeboat that Lytoller put in the water. But by the time he loaded lifeboat eight, he said he knew Titanic was doomed. It's at this point that he loads every boat to capacity. Or still, if he ran out of women to put in a boat, he still did not fill those empty seats with men, which I find very sad. About the time he's lowering lifeboat six, he said Chief Officer Wild approached him and asked about the weapons. Since he had been first officer during sea trials, he had actually taken care of the firearms because that is the duty of the first officer. Lightoller knew where they were. They were in his cabin. He showed them where, he opened it up, they took out the gun. He did take one, he did not load it. He said he felt even as he was helping them with this, that it felt unnecessary. Overall, he said that people behaved so admirably. He tells this story about people behaving very wonderfully in sort of a racist way, not sort of, in a racist way. He points out that all of the English speaking people performed very valiantly. He tells the story of a young man and a young woman just walking back and forth on the boat deck, him asking to help, her refusing to get in a boat even though he pleads with his eyes several times and offers her a spot. She says no. He feels that her refusal is very honorable. Yet anybody who tries to save themselves by filling these seats, he's leaving empty. He talks about one incident in which several dagos is the word he uses, which is a disparaging term for Italians, I believe. He says that this is the point in which he flourishes his gun, though it is not loaded, but that is the one time that he did use it to get those scoundrels out of that boat. Mostly the gun, though, stayed in his pocket with the cartridges completely separate. He said it took him about three minutes to get the gun, and he believed that ultimately that was three minutes wasted that he could have spent getting the boats away. Lightoller mentioned several couples who went down together. On the way back from getting the gun, he passed Isidore and Ida Strauss. He said they were standing there together in a corner. He approached them and asked if she would like to get in the lifeboat. He asked Ida, quote, can I take you along to the boats? He said she smiled. He said, Mr. Strauss said, Ida, why don't you go along with him? And she just smiled and said, no, not yet. And of course, many people know of the love story between Isidore and Ida Strauss in which she refused to get in the boat. They'd lived together their whole lives and they should die together too. He also says he approached a woman who it sounded like she was from the Western United States. And he approached her and asked if she would like to come along and get in a boat. And she replied, not on your life. We started together and if need be, we'll finish together. Boat after boat is lowered. Each time he's going back to check to see how high the water is rising. He is really getting upset that the ship that he can see is not responding to any of their rockets, to any of their wireless calls, to anything they are trying to do to reach it. Meanwhile, he said, they're loading the boats as full as they can. And there are two lifeboats left. Lightoller makes his final visit to the stairway. He said not only could he tell that she was going, but that she was going to go very soon. He was adamant that this ship would not go down with any lifeboats in the davits. So there wasn't a moment to lose. On his way back to these lifeboats, he ran into the purser, the assistant purser, as well as the surgeon and the junior surgeon. He said the junior surgeon was a jokester. And even at this horrible moment, he greeted everybody by saying, well, lights, are you warm? Because it was just so cold. They couldn't believe that all he had on was a sweater. Evidently, he started off with his jacket, but he had discarded it because he said he was absolutely covered in perspiration. He, they didn't say much, but they did all shake hands and they all said goodbye to one another because none expected to survive, of course. And Lytoller didn't think he was going to survive either. Last boat was away. 
and Lightoller turned his attention to the emergency boat, boat number two. On his way to this boat, he ran into the engineers who had finally been freed to come up to the boat deck. And when they got up, every single davit was hanging empty. These 35 men who die to a man had spent that whole time trying to keep the lights on so that people could get away. And then they come up only to find that there's literally no hope for them at all. Lightoller said there was no time to speak much to them, but he did greet them and I'm guessing say goodbye and wish them well. After emergency boat two was lowered away, all that remained were two collapsible boats. One was located next to the davits of emergency boat two. The other was on top of the officer's quarters. Quickly, they got one of them uncovered and put in number two's davits. It's at this point, he says he chases away the men, but he also reports he has trouble loading this boat because he can't find any women. They get it loaded though, they get it sent away. As it's going, Chief Officer Wilde comes up to him and says, why don't you get in this boat, Lightoller? There weren't any sailors to get in it. And he says, not bloody likely. He says he had no thought of martyrdom. It just was an impulse. He acted. He's been very glad that he did because he said he hasn't had to deal with the backlash of being a man that survived because he was pulled from the water. It was okay if you got pulled from the water. It wasn't okay if you were actually in a boat. And Margaret Brown would complain about this vigorously. She said that there was no reason for men to feel bad about this. For her, it was the modern world and women who were forced to leave without their husbands in such an unjust world for women. For her, that was just a slow death. They went away to lives of poverty and hardship because women couldn't make enough to support themselves by themselves. They had children. Those children were going to live without a father and in horrible, gut-wrenching poverty. But it was something men faced and a lot of men would make up stories about being in the water and being pulled from the water, even though they just happened to be in one of the first boats to go when no one else would get in. The collapsible boat on top of the officer's quarters was cut free. They then picked it up and dumped it over onto the boat deck. Sadly, it landed upside down. While doing all of this, he, he hears the familiar voice of Sam Hemming who had jumped out of a boat earlier and he said he was a little surprised. Is that you, Hemming? He said, yes, sir. He had been there the whole time. Lightoller had been so busy and it was so dark. He hadn't noticed that Hemming had been with him the whole time. And now here they were at the end and he asked Hemming, why haven't you gone? And Hemming smiled and replied, plenty of time yet, sir. The best they could do with this collapsible was just get it in the water so that it could float off and Maybe some people could get a hold of it and survive by getting on this boat. He said he went with Hemming over to the starboard side to see if there was anything that needed to be done there. All the boats were away. And at this time, he said the ship gave a very noticeable plunge. As Titanic made this final plunge, he said a wave broke over the deck. They were still standing on the officer's quarters. He said he watched people who weren't driven away beneath the water instinctively tried to climb up the stern, which was gradually rising higher and higher. He thought about the futility of what they were doing. He said, there was no point in doing that. It, all it did was postpone the inevitable. He said he also thought it lessened the chances of survival by making yourself part of this mass of hundreds of people. He decided to dive in. Hemming, by the way, did the same thing. And he was able to swim away from Titanic and he was picked up by a boat. Lightoller dove into the water and he described that 28 degree water as feeling like a thousand knives were being driven into you. For a few moments, he said he completely lost all thought as he absorbed how cold this water was and the shock. And once he overcame that, he said he noticed the crow's nest where the lookouts had been. At that point, it is level with him. It is just barely sticking out of the water. And at first he started swimming toward it before thinking, I can't take refuge on anything that is attached to Titanic. So he changes course and he turns around and he begins swimming away from Titanic. As the bow plunged down, there was a shaft that went down into the number three stokehold. 
that water began pouring down it. This was just aft or just behind the bridge and around the first funnel. And as water poured down this, it grabbed Lightoller and pulled him against the wire grating that covered this shaft to keep debris and grit or trash from falling down into the ship. He said, if this wire had given way, he would have fallen a hundred feet right down into the bowels of the ship. As the ship sank, he was held fast to this grate. He said no matter how hard he kicked or struggled or tried to free himself, the force of that water falling down that shaft held him tight. And he said within a couple of minutes, he would have drowned. And this whole time he's thinking about that wire giving way and him falling right down into Titanic, into this tomb. A bubble of hot air shot up that shaft and blew him away from Titanic. He said at this point, the ship was going down very fast and it was all, the water was swirling around and around. He said he was sucked back into another, he didn't know what, into something like that again, another shaft filling with water. And he doesn't know how he got free of that, but somehow he did. When Lightoller broke the surface again, he came up right by the collapsible boat that he and Hemming had just launched. It had floated off the ship he just stayed by it. He said, I didn't try to get on it at that point. I just was content to hang onto the rope. And he just kind of watched what happened. As the stern rose higher and higher, he watched as the expansion joints behind the first funnel split apart. He didn't say they that the ship broke, but that the strain was pulling them apart and stretching them. The wires holding the first funnel begin to break. First, the one on the port, then the one on the starboard, and he is on the starboard side of the ship. The collapsible boat is on this side, there's Titanic, and as the funnel falls, it falls between the boat and Titanic. And the wave that creates, he said it misses him by inches, so the wave it creates pushes the boat this way, away from Titanic. And it lands on so many people. The funnel has fallen. Several men have crawled on top of the overturned collapsible boat, and he does the same thing. He said he gets himself out of the water, which he was in far longer than he wishes he had been, and he got on top of the boat. And from there, he watches Titanic sink. And I'm going to read some, his exact words here because it's really incredible. He says, quote, Lights on board the Titanic were still burning, and a wonderful spectacle she made, standing out black and massive against the starlit sky, myriads of lights still gleaming through the portholes, from that part of the decks still above water. By this time, he says, up to the second funnel and forward toward the bow was completely underwater. And as it moved higher and higher into the sky, the lights went out. He said, you could still see the silhouette against the starlit night. And it's at this point that he mentions a terrible sound. He thinks it's the boilers, and maybe some of it is as it's raising higher all of the furniture inside. Everything is moving and crashing across the room as this moves into the sky, but it also is breaking in half. And with the lights out, it could be he was so close that they just didn't see that happen. He said all lights went out and the huge bulk was left in black darkness, but clearly silhouetted against the bright sky. Then the next moment, the massive boilers left their beds and went thundering down with a hollow rumbling roar through the bulkheads, carrying everything with them that stood in their way. This unparalleled tragedy that was being enacted before our very eyes now rapidly approaching its finale as the huge ship slowly but sure reared herself on end and brought rudder and propellers clear of the water till at last she assumed an absolute perpendicular position. And he puts that in italics. In this amazing attitude, she remained for the space of half a minute. Then, with impressive majesty and ever-increasing momentum, she silently took her last tragic dive to seek a final resting place in the unfathomable depths of the cold gray Atlantic. And he says that everyone around him, as if almost like a benediction, everyone just uttered the words, she's gone. After this, he describes Actually, he doesn't describe the sound that he hears of the people around him screaming and dying. Survivor Frank Goldsmith 
they called him Frankie as a little boy, he described the sound of those people freezing to death and drowning, like when someone hits a home run at a big league baseball game and the whole stadium erupts. He actually lived really near um, a stadium like that. And every time there would be a game, he was brought right back to Titanic. Lightoller said he tried really hard not to dwell on that noise and to block it from his mind. And he makes the comment in his book that some people would be alive today if they had done that. Because sadly, there were many survivors who committed suicide in the years after this. About 30 people survived the night on that upturned collapsible boat. Lightoller said that as the night wore on, the boat was slowly dipping further and further into the water. Also, the seas got rougher and it became necessary at some point, he said, for them to keep it upright. They had to do this thing where they all faced the same direction. They had to be spaced correctly. And he would try to give orders like we all need to lean to the left or we need to lean to the right to try to keep the boat balanced as this water is getting choppy and the boat is moving to try to keep it upright. Some people didn't make it through the night. Jack Phillips, who worked the wireless, he and Harold Bride both made it on board this collapsible. Harold would survive and Jack would not. But he was able to tell Lightoller that Carpathia was on its way, that it would be there in about four hours, and his information proved to be about correct. As the sun rose, Lightoller reported that most people were still standing upright on this collapsible. But the exposure, how cold they were, he said the water was around their feet at some point and totally creeping higher and higher as they stood there. And some people were just falling away and couldn't make it. Jack Phillips was one of them. He said they thought about trying to save his body, but they just weren't able to do that. They saw another lifeboat. And despite the fact that it was still quite full, they managed to get all 30 of these men into that boat. And Lightoller said people who weren't sailors didn't know how much in danger that boat was. He said it was very close to being so full that the water was barely staying out of that boat. He said they made it through almost on a prayer. Finally, they see Carpathia and they are rescued. He said they threw down kind of a sling for people. A lot of people were so cold, their hands wouldn't work to climb up the ladder. So they would sit in this little swing type thing and be pulled up. And Lightoller made sure he was the final person to get out of that boat and get onto Carpathia. Lightoller's account of the event was extremely useful during the Senate hearings in the United States, and there were also was also an inquiry in England. Lightoller didn't look very kindly on the American version. It happened first. It could be that they didn't prepare very well for it because it happened extremely quickly too. He was kind of hoping to get on a ship and get back to England before he had to take part in this, but they kind of grabbed him as soon as they arrived in New York, stashed him in a hotel, and they had to stay there and give testimony to this inquiry. He believed that at least some of the senators who were asking the questions they were just unbelievably stupid. <laughs> I, I hate to be so blunt about it, but that's basically what he's saying. They didn't know anything about the sea. They didn't know anything about ships. And they would ask questions that to him were just moronic. One that he actually found a little funny was when that first funnel fell on all of those people. The senator asked him, was anyone hurt? And he's like, yeah, this 50 ton funnel just fell on them. No, they weren't okay. So he didn't have a whole lot of respect for the American inquiry. He thought the one in England was a little better. In his later years, his life was just as interesting as it had been before Titanic. He continued to serve on the seas. He worked 20 years, was it 15 or 20 years for White Star Line. He did a little bit of spying for the Allies, taking his pleasure cruiser along the, um, along the coasts and reporting things back to England about things during the World Wars. Also during World War II, he took his yacht the Sundowner to Dunkirk, where he rescued 130 soldiers from Dunkirk. If you've seen the movie Dunkirk, Dawson, Mr. Dawson, named for the Titanic film, by the way, is 
Lightoller based on is based on Charles Lightoller. They named his yacht from Sundowner. In the movie, it's Moonstone. Sundowner is still there. Occasionally, for the reunion of the Dunkirk, they will take out ships that took part in the Dunkirk rescue and sail them again on the anniversary of Dunkirk. And Sundowner has taken part in that many times. I don't know if Sundowner appears in Dunkirk because in the film Dunkirk some of the vessels you see at the end of that movie actually were there at Dunkirk but he went with his son Roger and another boy who did not die during the trip things that are said to him to Dawson's character are things that were actually said to Lightoller like asking him how he got that many people on that vessel I can't remember the exact quote I apologize but it's when he gets back and the guys just keep getting off the boat and they ask him, you know, how he got so many people. But he had a tremendous life. He ended up dying in the early 1950s. It was during that smog epidemic in um, that happened in London around this time that killed a lot of people. And he was cremated. His survival on Titanic is an absolute miracle, in my opinion. I It just... It doesn't get any more dramatic than the stories he had to tell and how he survived this. And this is why Titanic is so fascinating because you have drama happening in the steerage section of the ship that is completely different from the drama happening in the engineering area where the engineers are trying to save Titanic from deep inside. You have people in the first class. You have all of this drama going on with different people there. And it's just so many different stories and you can go through so many different ones and hear another dramatic amazing story of survival from all over the ship and if being interested in that makes me morbid then i am morbid and happily so if you liked what you saw here please like this video and please subscribe to my channel because there's going to be more of this probably titanic related and all kinds of other things so thank you so much for joining me today I'm thinking it's possible we might have another Titanic story next week because I am going to be portraying Margaret Brown, Molly Brown, to many of you in a week and a half. And so I will use that opportunity to make a episode about her and review for my performance at the same time. I'll see you guys next week.